every GP is likely to see adults who've been significantly abused to children every day, and these are likely to be the most complex patients of the day. The problem is that we're not taught to consider that abuse might be relevant, and in fact might actually be the central problem. So I was actually in the care of the services from the age of three to the age of 18. Both myself and my sister were sexually abused for three years by one of those foster fathers. In every GP's day, there will be somebody coming through the door who's had these experiences, perhaps unnoticed, um, perhaps trying to hold it in, um, trying to handle it on their own. Complex trauma by its very nature can come in many guises and it can be very confusing even for quite seasoned practitioners. The childhood experiences that would relate most to trauma would be sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional neglect. Many parents have themselves had very difficult experiences that they haven't resolved and they can be unwittingly passing on the negative effects to their children. All children uh, need a consistent figure, so that's what we would call their secure base or their primary attachment figure. The paradox of you know, complex trauma is that it's perpetrated generally by people who are significant attachment figures in that child's life. So somehow they've got to find a, a way of eking out a relationship with somebody who's a close attachment figure and is also their primary abuser. and trauma sets up vulnerability to the whole range of later mental health problems and common social and personal difficulties, particularly difficulties in relationships. We're used to being close to people who are in physical pain as well as emotional pain. It's part of our, our everyday connection with people. And in the area of trauma, it means that we've got a skill set that enables us to come close to people while they're revealing something that's difficult for them to say. You know, I was having a breakdown. Uh, I didn't know what was happening and certainly my medical colleagues didn't know either and nor did they inquire. I was virtually bedbound for a couple of years. And how do people make sense of that if they don't understand it? And certainly my medical colleagues and my own medical training didn't help me at all. Given the prevalence of trauma in our community um, and its impact on individuals, uh, I think it's essential that GPs understand um, what complex trauma is, how to assess it and refer as needed. I was fine. I knew I was molested, I knew I was raped as a teen and I would say those things, that's fine, I would say it's so matter of fact. But the self-loathing and the guilt and the shame and the words that would come up about who I was was very internal. The process of connecting with someone who's had trauma is really important. Uh, the key goal is to make sure that they feel safe and to go at their pace uh, with them making the choices. Um, and our relationship is of a collaborative one where we're working with them uh, to achieve their goals and, um, and their timing. At the age of 14, my sister Carol, half-sister Carol, found us and included us in her family. And in that environment of trust and acceptance, was able to um, be mothered for the first time in my life. I was terrified of being a mother because I didn't know what a mother did. So having a baby and an infant and a little child was really scary. It's very important that we try and develop trusting, working relationships with people to allow them um, to discuss concerns they have about early childhood experiences. Sometimes trauma makes them feel hopeless and our heart sinks when we see them and that's because their heart is sinking too. Um, and so growing in our competence so that we don't join in with the hopelessness is such a big part of this um, journey. Um, and not being intimidated by the story um, and not needing to know the whole story. And it's more about sustaining the person in the present while holding an awareness of what has happened to them in the past. The more adverse events you have in your childhood, the more and more likely you are to have significant increased susceptibility 
to a range of psychological outcomes and a range of physical illnesses. By that point, you're more likely to have drug and alcohol problems. You're more likely to you know, end up with heart disease, lung cancer. Many of our most common and serious medical problems, heart, lung and liver disease, may be the end result of coping mechanisms adopted by sufferers to manage the after effects of abuse. These include very common behaviours like overeating, drinking, smoking and promiscuity. These behaviours are actually very helpful in the short term as they moderate the distressing emotions that sufferers experience. People might present with physical health complaints. Uh, they might present with a whole range of bodily difficulties, post-traumatic stress disorder or clear memories and re-experiencing of early trauma. We have disguised presentations where someone can't put into words what's happened to them. Um, others will come hiding it, uh, really fearing that anyone might know, um, carrying deep shame and those ones require us to be very carefully noticing um, of what the understory might be. Um, and others come in, in crisis, with relational crisis or stories, repeated stories of, of ways of relating to people that show that trust and interpersonal relationships have been damaged at some time in their life story. I really was a bit anti practitioners actually because there wasn't the listening I can see now there's more to this pie than just medication and it comes with hearing and compassion and being able to be heard often. Uh, but I see medication really as a sidearm to treatment. Rather than thinking that people who have suffered from trauma are victims requiring our help, um, to see them as people who have endured something that we ourselves might find unbearable um, and have somehow survived and to notice what it is that helped them do that. I think there needs to be a lot of education. You know, a system that depends on symptoms, signs, diagnosis and pathology. And pathology by definition is, you know, what's the disease, what's wrong with someone just doesn't look at why someone has reacted as they have, why they're coping as they have, why they coped as they did as a child, where they're up to now. Trauma can be resolved. It's very important that people realise that. We now know that the brain is not hardwired but um, neuroplastic, which means that it's capable of regeneration. With the right support, it is possible to recover from trauma. Uh, but I think the holding of the complexity is actually a real skill. And to be unwilling to prematurely dis close down on one diagnosis. Um, the number of people who I've seen who have complex trauma histories who've had multiple diagnoses, where they've got their, e their eating disorder, their alcohol use, misuse, their bipolar or um, some other depression or anxiety all labelled against them when the ultimate cause and the diagnosis could be something as simple as understanding that they're complex trauma survivors and all of those are the results of that. Having um, the capacity um, and organising practice so that it is possible to see someone regularly in a preventive way um, to discuss some of those person, that person's core life issues um, and to be able to be a coherent and consistent figure, being able to become a person who's trustworthy, who's available, uh, but having the practice and the broader connections in the community sector, um, again, not to fall into the trap of believing that you have to do it all by yourself um, and that the person uh, themselves is better informed about emergency access to treatment and support. Guidelines that ASCA has given the world, actually internationally recognised guidelines, um, are a really great summary of what is needed when we're offering trauma-informed care. And that includes safety, um, collaborative care, giving the person choice and empowering them, um, being trustworthy and providing quality in the care. And my hope is that 
that could be something that all GPs could learn how to offer. Let your practice be informed by the, by the belief that you think and know that recovery is absolutely possible. Absolutely possible to, to recover from a time where, you know, uh, one feels there is no hope and there is no future at a time. I was so um, subsumed by the past that I lived in the past. Flashbacks were my daily life. Um, I couldn't even imagine a present, let alone a future. Uh, but now to be able to, to plan um, and look forward to things and enjoy things. Da, 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 da.